Hello, my name is Greg Madison, and this is The Living Process. And on this episode, I'm in conversation with Christian Dillo. Christian is uh, a fascinating uh, Zen teacher, although you'll hear in our conversation that he doesn't readily label himself as um, a teacher, although he is the resident teacher at uh, Boulder Zen Center. Um, but there's a real kind of aliveness, I think, in this conversation where we talk a little bit about his practice, how he came across focusing, and how he recognized himself in Jenlin's description of the focusing process, how he already knew enough to kind of pause and find the right word when he was trying to um, not lose himself, I guess, in his interactions with others. In the conversation, we talk quite a bit about the similarities in practice, the Zen practice that he describes and the focusing practice that he knows and that I also describe, and also some of the differences and how it could be useful for both his community and the focusing community to have a little bit more of what the other community emphasizes. Um, I don't think I want to say too much more than that, but it was a very, for me, very engaging conversation. And at the end, we do express uh, a desire to keep in contact, and I would really welcome that. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Christian Dillo and uh, The Living Process. Welcome, Christian. I've really been looking forward to this. I feel very uncertain where our conversation might go because I've never met you before. Uh, but what I normally ask people to begin with is just how did you come across focusing and Gentlin's work? Curious about that. Yeah. Ready have to do a little focusing, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Well, it um it comes out of a particular uh life situation in my um early twenties. And the context isn't so much oh, I'm studying psychotherapy or this is coming to me as a method. Yeah. But it's coming out of a um, my own situation and my own existential crisis. Like, I'm noticing that life doesn't have the same kind of depth when I'm using my intellect just stringing concepts together in a way that makes sense to other people and then i pretend to myself that it also makes sense to me and i'm weaving uh, a sense of identity and and who i am and what i want to be from these concepts that string themselves together and it feels like a, just a kind of social and cultural conditioning you know? So I I feel that there was a process in my life that led to a sense of you know not not being in touch with myself, having lost myself in some way. And then it's also true that that was never the case because the search for you know a different kind of being in touch with myself, a, a different kind of meaning making, is already a sense that that touch isn't fully lost and something. Mm. So, and this is like, this goes back into my teenage years. And then when I started to become explicit, I made the decision to explicitly study language and um, in relationship to the body. 
then uh, Jenton just kind of like popped up. And then I was delighted to find um, an articulation and a, and a set uh, of concepts that were already describing something that I was dealing with. And uh, to, to, uh, to, to a large extent already experiencing, but not being able to articulate on my own. So then, then uh, there's a lot of excitement for me. It's like, well, here, you know, this is exactly what I'm feeling and thinking about. So let me just say some of that back to you. Um, I think it's very common that many of us who have come into the focusing world in some way, to some extent, start from something in our own lived experience. Um, I think even people like myself who maybe take a therapeutic training and find it there as well, we only pick it up and continue with it because it resonates with something that we know from our lives. So I think that's really common. Um, I think it's interesting as well that it it's it it grabs those people for whom it touches something that was missing. And it sounds like again another experience that I can certainly relate to that conceptualizing can leave underneath it a kind of an emptiness. Other people may be convinced by what you're saying, but you know inside of yourself it's somehow not touching home or something. And when you came across Jendlin's work, there was something in the way that he was putting experience into words that it didn't leave the body behind. Yeah. Yeah, I... I mean, I've discovered on my own how to not leave the body behind, and finding Jenton's work was actually confirming that my method was correct. Because I um, I write about that in my book, too, is like that as a teenager, I was an awkward person in the sense that I paused in ways that were not, you know, socially conform. It's yeah. like... I would wait and see what I really wanted to say, and it would take the time that it took. And and so I had a reputation for, you know, making these weird pauses that were not quite right. Um, but then, you know, discovering Jenlin's work and uh, felt sense and attending to the felt sense and letting it come and letting myself carry the situation forward from that pause just confirmed that I had intuitively, you know, found something. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it wasn't so much that Jendlin was a revelation, which in many ways it also was, but also a confirmation of something yeah. that I had, you know, discovered on my own. Yes. Yeah. I can, uh, I can understand that. For me, coming across Jentlin was also a confirmation, and it helped me that there was someone in authority, like this professor, that said <laughs> it was okay to do what you were doing or to pay attention to what you knew was there. But I'm curious with you, it's like even as a teenager, how did you persevere? Were you encouraged to continue to pause in the way you were doing and waiting for the right word to come how did you yeah no it was just an inner knowing that the price for not doing it was too high okay i know it's a, the price would be some sort of alienation or uh dissociation that i saw in other people and that and i've and i had a sense of deeply not wanting that but that also meant there was a there was also a not knowing of how to avoid it and so this the awkwardness of the pausing came out, out of that tension hmm. and somehow when you came across focusing it confirmed what you were doing but my understanding having looked at some of your things online 
is that it remains, although integrated into other things, uh, it remains quite a core way of expressing yourself, understanding your experience. Is that right? What is, what is the it that you're naming there as it? This um, emphasis on prioritizing your own, if you want to call it authenticity, and speaking from your experience of living and not being satisfied with ways of talking that uh, leave that behind, that somehow that sort of whole way of being is remain has remained core for you? Yeah. Yeah, it, it very important. As you, I think you were implying, integrated in other... Um, yeah. Don't even die. I don't even know what the word is here. Um, orientations, uh, explorations. You know, authenticity is an extremely uh, difficult word for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think I know what you mean. And so from, from that, I would say, yes, it is about authenticity. And then I think the ways us authenticity as a word is used in our current contemporary culture is also problematic and kind of flat even it's like this kind of authenticity that i think we both mean here isn't about uh what feels good to me you know right now and uh as if it this was about satisfying some shallow desire uh, of this or that sort. Mm -hmm. um, this kind of authenticity, if we want to start using the word differently in, in a wider sense, always implies others. It implies, you know, if I think this more with Gentlin's vocabulary, it always implies implies the whole situation it's in that sense it is actually not about self it's about uh it's about something that transcends self and other and is it and it, it is the situation as a whole mm -hmm. and then, then if authenticity means how does the situation want to use me to be carried forward in the right way then I think we're talking about an authenticity that is different from what, you know, most people understand right away when it's like, you know, I want to live an authentic life. But anyway, it has these layers. And uh, I, I find that I'm digging deeper there, deeper and deeper, you know, deeper than I did when I was 16, or, you know. I'm curious about that. Um... I agree. Authenticity can be used in very many different ways and probably increasingly in this day and age in quite a superficial way um, and even be an argument for being self-centered or something. But I, I'm curious, when you talk about authenticity as implying the whole situation and not just what I might want in the situation as though I exist separate from it, but what the situation might require of me, that authenticity then becomes some kind of a process. And maybe it's even a question, does that process originate in the self, whatever we mean by that, or does it originate someplace else? Yeah, it neither originates, originates in the self nor somewhere else. It's just like to to force the question into that contradiction is, I think, wrong, or mis. I mean, it's misleading because it implies that I have to make a decision between one or the other. It is, um, I mean, that's because I'm a, a Buddhist practitioner. I mean, that is the whole notion of non-self. Is like it's not like that. There's no self, but it's just like that we get trapped in this contradiction between self and other or self and the world or self and the situation as if 
there was an original division between the two. But to give a really silly example is like if you fly in an airplane with a pilot and the pilot decides to be authentic and share, and, and I mean this now in this like superficial way, share everything he or she feels and, you know, what he or she might want or not want to do while sitting in the cockpit, you know, the passengers would be quite uncomfortable. It's like, what are you, why are you telling us this? This is, you know, just do your job. And so their authenticity can come into um, a contradistinction with professionalism, right? It's like, for example, teachers, you know, if you're in a classroom, you want to be authentic with your students. Well, do the students really need your authenticity of like what you're feeling, what your emotions are, what your personal life is and so forth, if authenticity means also that? Well, you know, you have a job to do. It's like, let the situation tell you what is appropriate in this, what is an appropriate action or response in this situation. So sometimes what we call the self has to be set aside in order to meet the situation appropriately. So, um, but you can never leave yourself out of the situation. <laughs> so implicitly, everything that's going on for you will also influence what you're capable of at this time or what, you know, feels right to do. So it's a tricky, tricky territory to uh, puzzle out mm -hmm. conceptually, but I don't think that in the actual living process, it's complicated. It's, it can be quite obvious, you know, what you need to engage or not engage at any given time. Those are interesting examples. I um, I guess I'm most interested in situations where we pause, like we're doing now in our conversation, and we sense a little bit the interaction between us as well as what's happening in me and what's happening in you, because we're not the same. Um, and then the question for me does arise, how would you, do you have language for that that doesn't immediately import some kind of a separation between self and situation? Yeah. I speak of undivided activity. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, every situation, we could even say every person, every, every being, every yeah. object is an undivided activity. So as soon as we think of it as a separate activity, I mean, activity is already a reframing of objectness personhood to just to know that it's an activity or a process um and it's undivided from all other activities and processes that we could delineate and separate out so to to cultivate a feeling that this is always an undivided field of activity i mean we can supercharge this with more stuff and say it's an undivided field of interactivity, or it's like, an, um, or I think Jendlin has used the word imperfection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this, to think of undividedness rather than oneness, for example, which you know some spiritual traditions might want to talk about oneness. Oneness is too much. Uh, not two-ness, undividedness, is not the same as oneness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say, so that reminds me, some of Jendlin's terms, um, inter-affecting, unseparated multiplicity, interaction first, I think are pointing at the same kind of territory in some way. Mm. But in that case... I mean, I, I like the term. That's, I think it's very useful. Um, what is, I don't know how to ask this in a way that doesn't already presume 
the wrong answer. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> how? What's the status of the self in that sort of undivided activity or interactivity or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't quite know what status means here. So you, you yeah. have to say more um, about what you're really asking about. Yeah, exactly. I, the The word status was wrong, but um, I was struggling to find. Um, I don't exactly know how to ask the question, but it's something as simple as, even in the way you say it, it's not about oneness. There mm -hmm. are, you know, you and I are individuals, whatever that means, and I guess that's the question. And we're not separate individuals, even through this medium, there's an interaction between us, there's some kind of an energetic connection and responsiveness even if we're not in the same room. Um, somehow that happens. But what is it that keeps us from being a oneness? Like, what is this the, the self of you and I? How do yeah, you know well, my, my uh, habit is to avoid metaphysical questions. I mean, I'm, I, I don't pretend that I really know about ontology, let's say. Okay. I, I, really, I, I just don't deal in ontology as much as possible. It's like, so, um, I, I feel my approach is, you know, very pragmatic. It's like about uh, what is a good beneficial uh next step that is possible in any process and uh meaningful and you know and beneficial right, in that territory um so maybe maybe we can look at you know very simple situations like if we were one does that mean i could ask you to pay my bills i mean literally my financial bills and also my you know moral bills maybe like could I, could you do that for me and then we find out no this is just not the case it's like you are not paying my bills and I'm not paying your bills. Mm -hmm. So we have some, there's some separateness that we need to acknowledge and um, and live. I mean, this also has, you know, you, you're also not going to the toilet for me and you're not eating for me. And uh, so that's also a separateness. So, like, I look at the self as a, a fundamental situation in which I need to take care of certain things and have responsibility for aspects of my existential situation that, that cannot be done by someone else. Um, you're also not going to die for me, or, you know, like if we want to be existential or so. Mm -hmm. That has there is some kind of um, individuality there from which a lot follows, and it's it's like it's almost impossible to spell out everything that follows from it. But we can, I think, we can honestly feel that that it's yeah. it's ne necessary for each individual to take care of themselves. Yes. And for me, an example of that is even in a conversation. If one person smiles or laughs, it's not it's not just arbitrary that it that it's that person that smiles or laughs. Mm -hmm. you know, it it it's not like it could has e as easily have been the other person. 
and it's just by chance it's that person it's that person for a particular reason it comes out of their whole unique ongoingness in some way whatever that is you know their life elaboration their life up until that moment and what carries them forward into the next moment in some way um <clears throat> but in terms of practice i'm wondering well first of all did did you ever coming across Jonathan, did you ever have an interest in or maybe you did get involved in the focusing world in any way in communities or workshops or meet up with other focusing people no i didn't and there's a there's an element of regret in me okay and um and then also and i mean maybe almost like i could wonder about why not um And I think the reason, I mean, I had I I did have a great interest in meeting uh Gene, but it, it sort of my life didn't come together that way because I practiced monastically. And if you want, we can talk about what that meant, but there's a it's a long period. And not that I was locked away, but it, it's just like my there was a different orientation in my life. Um but I would say underneath it is actually a certain kind of reluctance and resistance to focusing as a method. Like I, I never felt a strong need to, um, learn it properly, teach it, understand it more. Um, I I was always more intrigued actually by Jendlin's philosophical work and his um reassessing of certain terms and, and invention of new terms that were describing for me vital processes that I felt I was already intimate with. Um so yeah, it's it's unresolved as like it's really it is a a little bit of a regret i don't know a better word and since like that this is like there are missed opportunities and then also a certain sense of freedom and mm -hmm. not getting sucked into some other you know way of thinking and community and playing by new rules and <laughs> so i'm curious where did your practice take you? Where did my practice take me? You mean my Zen practice or well, my life? <laughs> yeah, well, somehow you got into Zen. Yeah. And I'm just curious the direction you took, sort of how that was right for you. Yeah. Maybe there too it's useful to for me to reflect on Kind of like what's the context out of which it arose because there's something surprising for me even you know just looking back at my life it's like i wasn't looking for a spiritual practice i wasn't i wasn't like spiritually inclined i'm quite uh skeptical of religion and and uh like I have not much interest in metaphysics or so it's curious to me that there's an aspect of my life where I put on robes and sit in front of people and talk about, you know, what other people experience as spiritual teachings, you know. <laughs> so it's a little weird. Um but the origin of my spiritual practice is really in a sense of depression. And I use that word and I don't use it, I'm not pretending I'm using it in a clinical way or in a diagnostic way. Uh, there was a sense of not being fully alive. 
Mm -hmm. and, and it's a period of like five years in my life of feeling um, less than fully engaged and, and held back in a way. And there's a kind of strange, for me, hard to grasp, underlying fear. And it bothered me tremendously. I mean, it's just like just bothered me. Um, very disturbing. Because on the surface of my life, things were, you know, fine. I mean, I was, I had a satisfying social life and partner and I was like, I guess, nominally successful in what I was doing, and, you know, academically and but it just didn't feel fulfilling. Okay, so I I felt like I had to pause with this. And my way of pausing was to leave Germany and go to San Francisco for a year. This was like, and I literally had the sense of like, I'm just pausing and I just used an academic exchange program to get somewhere else and pause. Right. And then I, and there was something that was continuing. It was an interest in developing, how would we call this, like body awareness and sensitivity. So I was engaged with various like practices that were centered on feeling myself better. Mm -hmm. um, and I was living with, someone like in a shared housing situation and she said well i'm going to this place sometimes you know you want to come and like they have you know a talk and, and because i just didn't have anything better to do so i said so, you know, i come and it was a, a zendo and i entered and i got some minimal instruction you know like if i had, i gave this instruction today i have developed different language it was like Invite your spine into uprightness, you know, sit with an open heart and bring attention to the sensations of breathing. They didn't say that, but that's what I would say today. Um, and I did that. And something happened. I mean, I felt like something fell off and I felt what I'm now calling unapologetically alive. Just like, just like this. So I made a big impression on me. <laughs> and then there was also an affinity to this Zen aesthetic, just like feeling at home in this aesthetic. It, it was very, a very aesthetic decision. It's like, well, this is like a no frills approach to life, nothing extra. That was just suiting my personality. And I understand that that's not like for everyone, but it was, you know, it was a good, um, yeah, aesthetic. I mean, aesthetics carry a lot. Yeah. So like they carry a lot of postural, um, Yeah, but knowing, like, so anyway, uh, I, I just continued because this experience was so profound. And um, and it cured my depression, which was like, wow, that's nice. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's nice. And I've understood over over uh, the years of making more sense of what's happening when you sit in a certain way and practice a certain kind of mental posture that I was um, shying away from intensity. Bodily intensity, bodily felt intensity. Um, you know, we can 
I think we can, as human beings, we can shy away from unpleasant, painful intensity. And we can also shy away from um, pleasant um, yeah, intensity. And so depression for me was a kind of, you know, defensive, protective posture. And I had to learn to realize that. And little by little, notice the many layers of resistance to intensity that uh, that had, you know, I don't know, it's hard to say where stuff comes from, build up or, you know, you born with this stuff or is there some intergenerational thing going on? I don't know. But it's there. And you got you kind of have to deal with it. If you don't deal with it, you're not fully alive. Yeah. So so but also then the Buddhist, the Zen Buddhist discourse that I've encountered started to um I, I just had a feeling like, wow, this is speaking in a way that makes sense to me. Like maybe for the first time, getting me out of uh, this idea that I had to figure out life in some sort of conceptual, philosophical way, therapeutic way. And Buddhism just sort of laid it out for me. In a, I mean, I, what I heard was like, yeah, that makes sense. It's very pragmatic. Mm -hmm about um liberation from suffering wisdom and compassion yeah that matters to me so let's do this <laughs> you use the term mental postures i'm curious i don't understand what that means Yeah, maybe a, um, another word you could use there is view or frame, like a mental frame or a view that you hold that structures a lot. Behavior, thoughts, approaches to life. You know? So um, I like the word posture here because like a physical posture that implies a lot, there are mental postures that imply a lot and that um for example i mean i i use the term maybe in a in too generous way it's not actually that clearly defined because i think it sort of touches into something that people do understand intuitively but we could say well uh, it makes a difference whether you come from a posture of gratitude or a posture of complaint that would be an example, right? It's like, so is it useful to switch from a posture of complaint to a posture of uh, gratitude? Yeah, for many people, that's a really would be an important change. <laughs> it see, I I look at teachings as antidotes. So if you are not mired in a dysfunctional posture of complaint, then there's nothing wrong with complaining now and then, you know. But if you've made it your posture. It's very limiting. Mm -hmm. If you make then gratitude your posture and you try to be grateful for everything, you know, in an exaggerated way, then maybe <laughs> the teaching would be, why don't you start complaining a little bit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like that. Postures are also something that a place you usually come from. Mm -hmm. I was curious because of the term posture, and I wasn't sure if it was more like that kind of psychological stance, or if it was more concretely a posture in the body. Well, it it alludes to that, because my basic view is that body and mind are not separate, they're undivided. We can experience them separately, but fundamentally they're undivided. So to speak about a mental posture is already mixing body and mind, which I think is a welcome, you know, complication or <laughs> provocation, right? depending on where people are with this kind of inquiry of like, well, what, what about body and mind? Are they separate, related, mm -hmm. not one, not two. 
so in your own trajectory, you kind of stumbled across Zen practice. It had, it sounds like, quite a profound impact on you as a person. Um, there's things that you liked about the tradition that appealed to you. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point then, rather than it simply being your practice or of personal benefit, you took it further and decided to actually make it a part of your life as a teacher? Yeah, well, I can't say that was a decision. It's like, it's just something I grew grew into, you know, because um, I, as much as possible, I don't look at myself as a teacher. I mean, if I have to put something on a website and say I'm the resident or guiding teacher of the Boulder Zen Center or something, but I think it's very useful to for me to look at the activity that I'm engaged in. And the activity that I'm engaged in, I would describe as I'm sharing my practice with others. And I grew into that. It's like some people benefit from being I say they're benefiting or coming back for this kind of sharing. So then I, I, I've i learned to say yes to that and say, like, yeah, okay. It seems like that's useful to some people, so I'll do it. But if, I would say, you know, if that started to, if, if that stopped to be the case, I would cease to be a teacher and probably it would be good to stop. But it sounds like the way that you teach, it is a continuation of your practice in a way. Yeah. I mean, if if I want to place this more in Western um, terms and contexts, and maybe also connected with Gentlin, he, he doesn't use that term, but I see myself as a phenomenologist. Right? It's like I'm studying experience mm -hmm. and what i found frustrating in western phenomenology is that it's mostly descriptive it describes what we find when we observe experience and what i found uh what buddhism brought which was revelatory to me it's like buddhism also is a phenomenology but it is a transformative phenomenology. And, and I, what I mean by that is it, it never divorces itself from the idea of transformation and in the direction of liberation from suffering, wisdom, and compassion. It, it doesn't pretend to be a science at all. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't leave out the normative. And I think our living process is that way, where we can leave out the normative. Like, our being is wanting to uh, unfold in the direction of liberation, wisdom, and compassion. So I just didn't find that in, um, in Western philosophical approaches much. With, and there's, there's just, I think... In the West, there's psychotherapy that is doing that. And that's why Buddhism and psychotherapy can talk to each other because they're both transformative phenomenologies. And then Gentlin occupies a special place in that. In, and then also in my heart, because even though he doesn't describe it that way himself, he clearly from, is a transformative, he, he practices transformative phenomenology. Right. So um so in in some sense I could have just as well ended up in a in the focusing world as you called it, mm -hmm. not in Zen Buddhism. And sometimes I fantasize that God, you know, I maybe I could just strip myself of the, you know 
aspects of Zen that I also find kind of cumbersome and weird and like, but then I'm very pragmatic. It's like it allows for something that is not present. It's like when I watch Gentlin videos, let's say, right? And his like stubborn insistence that he's not talking about the ultimate or spiritual practice or that he wants intentionally a secular context in which people don't feel alienated. So it just appears like he's there as this secular person. Right? It, it appeals to me. I like it. But it also leaves something out. There's a context, and when you frame something as explicitly spiritual, you take all the vestiges of it, you know, I don't take all of them, but, you know, some. <laughs> Something else is possible. A sacredness can appear, like it did for me, you know, when I first entered this zendo and had this experience, and then I had other experiences along the way, that I don't think are invited in the same way in other contexts. So th from that point of view, I'm respecting what I've done all these years, decades even. And I have a hard time just, you know, throwing it overboard and say like, oh God, this is just like hocus pocus or something, because it's not. Yeah. There's a, there is an element of embodiment and, and what I think is even more important of mutual embodiment in ritual that is absent from like how I imagine a focusing conference. Yeah, definitely. Well, there are some rituals, but they're they you participate or don't and resist at the same time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I think what you well, I want to respond to some of the things you've been saying. One is I think focusing can also be taught in that way as a continuation of practice mm -hmm. rather than leaping from the practice into something else called teaching. Yeah. So I think there's that commonality potentially. I also would see focusing as a, a kind of the term that I would use as process phenomenology. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that, it has this transformative or therapeutic uh effect even if that's not the intention if the intention is simply to describe experience experience in response to being described if you're in touch with the experience is it has this tendency to move forward and to try to trans well transform or do something therapeutic to the person that's engaged in it i would say that would be my way of saying it yeah, I'm not sure if you're if that's I fully agree because there's this one, I mean, in the focusing process, there's this this crucial uh moment. And maybe there are there's more vocabulary than I've learned, but you know what what I've um understood as what the felt shift is, right? This shift is implies something normative. It implies rightness. Yes. So it's not just accidental that it also has a transformative effect. The process itself implies or feeds on, is dependent on, and goes for rightness. Yeah. I would agree with that. Because otherwise, it's it it's actually your experience. Otherwise, is that you're stuck. Yeah, it's not an accident that the process, at least, tends towards something more. Something more. Something more that has this right feeling to it. This more life. This expansiveness, or something like that. That's not an accident. That's for some reason that's what life does but yeah it is i think it's easier if you don't go in pushing for that 
I think it's more likely to happen if you take that as a moment of grace or something like that, that life comes if it's given enough space and it brings this next step. It brings a shift in the body. To be focusing, looking for a shift, I think, is more difficult. That's what I meant in that it's accidental in that respect. It's almost like a side effect of being with yourself under certain conditions, maybe. Yeah, okay. But I, I want to get to the the last thing that you were talking about. Um, I, you know, the, the thing that you're saying, I think you could you could yet end up in the focusing community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I feel that, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to say, I mean, Gendlin was so careful all the time, and this is exactly what you've spotted. He was always so careful not to stray very much at all into the spiritual territory. And if he did, he would immediately undermine it in some way so as not to get identified with any kind of tradition or, or whatever. I think his intention was to keep that all open for anyone that came in with their own spiritual interest or whatever. Um, I think that's one side of it. I think the other side of it is that maybe Gendlin and maybe this is commonly felt in the focusing world to some extent, that there's a wariness around community. And I think a huge value is placed on community, but at the same time, there's a wariness of what community can do to the individual, how to keep alive in some way your own fullness as a person while being engaged in community, that there's that tension that I think focusing people are very aware of, and I'm sure a lot of other people are also aware of that. Um, but if you came in with your interests and you wanted to develop in a spiritual way, I I would imagine your focusing practice would take you there. And that that would, without any of the accoutrements of a spiritual practice, you would find yourself in a spiritual practice. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, yeah. I don't know the focusing world. So I'm, when I, yeah, I, I don't think about it much. It's just like I may have some, the things you just said, and there has a felt sense that arises from that, and maybe some speculation. And yeah, yeah. but um, let me start in a in a kind of um, in a different place. One of the things that I feel like I've done through my Zen practice is studying attention. Mm -hmm. And I've come to make a simple distinction between uh, focus and field. Focused attention and field-like attention. And when I say focus and field here, it has nothing to do immediately with focusing. It's just a, this is a coincidence. I really just mean this is a technical term as attention can be focused or it can be widened and become field-like. Mm -hmm. Now, these are sort of modes in which attention can function. And we could maybe also say, well, maybe attention is on a spectrum from very focused to, you know, being completely field-like. What I mean by field is um, you are aware, and awareness is a word that I'm using for field like attention, aware of everything all at once and nothing in particular. Whereas when your attention is focused, you are aware of something particular and you are almost discarding other aspects of the field. Um, so 
So now back to focusing. Focusing is doing something with focused attention. So the 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 name is somewhat appropriate mm -hmm. because I'm noticing a felt sense and I'm deciding and make a certain effort. And sometimes it takes a quite an effort in my experience to stay with that particular felt sense, that particular intricacy, that particular situation that uh, that is present for me in this felt sense. Okay. In order to do that, now it's um, this the the attention as a field awareness is implied. It's in it, we could say it's in the background. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the reason I think a therapist can be so helpful in a focusing process is because a therapist can hold the field for me if I'm not quite able to do it. And the therapist holds an open space, the field, and can also help me to regain focus. It's like, oh, my mind strays and I get, you know, well, what about, you know, coming back to that feeling that you called such and such? Um, so sometimes I think when focusing is described too much as a method, whatever too much means here, we can explore that. Too much as a method, it um, emphasizes focused attention and doesn't really notice the field, the space, the nothing in particular <laughs> awareness in which all of this happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then something more happens if you employ and and you said something to that extent you know if you if you want a felt shift if you employ the focusing process to solve a problem of whatever kind you know it becomes instrumentalized and what zen practice is for me that is quite in contrast to focusing is there is a constant invitation to rest in the field, to yeah. practice, to just practice openness, just practice openness, just practice that. So then it's not that no content arises in, in that openness, quite the contrary, contents do arise. But interestingly is there's a satisfaction that comes from just resting in the field which is actually even if you have problems because you're not focusing them you can have an experience of like nothing's missing everything's okay now i i take this one step further and then i'm curious what you think i can and a focusing focusing process used too much as a method right disregards in a way implicitly doesn't want to do that but it does so implicitly that not not all problems need to be solved hmm. and that i can be quite liberated and content with having a whole bunch of problems mm -hmm. in in a in a strange and important discovery can be made there it's like these problems belong to my process and that's okay not just okay it's like i deserve these problems now when i use the word deserve there is like i'm using it in a new way like in a gentle like that's a new deserving mm -hmm. it doesn't mean like i'm wishing problems on people but i can discover for myself that it is my job to have these problems and yeah may i just say that to have them mm -hmm. because that is the way it is 
And that has something to do with what we said previously about self. That also is part and parcel of myself. And to find a kind of resolution with that, rather than a struggle that something needs to be healed or changed or, you know, I have to go to therapy with this. There's some fundamental uh, ease that could come with just resting in the field with everything that belongs to it, including all these problems that are quite disturbing and bothersome, but, you know, nonetheless, mm -hmm. here I am. And focusing as much as I've benefited from it, you know, has not, like, directed me there. But Zen practice has. That's so interesting to me because... Uh, I've spoken to a few, I mean, the focusing world's full of people that are also in the Buddhist world. And I don't think there's, I think it makes a lot of sense that that is the case. But I, I've always been interested in exactly this point. What is it that the Buddhist world or the spiritual practice as you're describing it adds to or adds to focusing or how does it take a different turn or something like that or have a different emphasis so i'm glad we're talking about this the first thing i would say um i feel like as a psychotherapist and psychologist i feel like saying let's get them off the table <laughs> um, because i think we can probably discuss it just with the more usual focusing um setup where there's a focuser and a listener and most focusing is done with simply a listener there, giving their presence, reflecting back to the focuser, assisting the focuser to stay with their experience. And that that tends to be a very helpful setup because just the presence of a person, even if they say nothing already, makes the experience more alive. Um, as we spoke about earlier, because there isn't a separation, there's already something happening there. But when you were making the distinction between focused awareness and the field, I wanted to say, in focusing, we have both. And I think you would agree with that, if I say a little bit more. But it's a little bit different, I think, than where you took it. In order to focus, you have the felt sense that right now I can feel something in my chest. I could bring my focus to that and have the more focused attention you're talking about, where I really let myself feel that. And the felt sense in response to my attention, it becomes a little bit more present and I could stay with it and see where it takes me. It's also true that in focusing, we would often say to ourselves or to another person focusing, see if it's okay just to give that some space and to really feel more of the field around the felt sense and to have both at once, that the space or the field, as you're saying, is an important stance or experiential perspective or wider sense of being or something from which to pay attention to something more specific that then temporarily becomes an object in your awareness that you can watch it. One thing I would say is that I wouldn't say as a focuser I'm out to solve problems or as a psychotherapist. I would say I'm investing my self in the other's discovery that to simply be with their sense of something, if you can be with it in this spacious way that I think we're both sort of describing, the felt sense of its own accord begins to do something. And from that bodily processing, insights, images, words tend to arise from the experiencing. They don't always, but there's a tendency for that to happen. So rather than trying to solve problems, we simply keep company with what is there as a problem, and it solves itself if you have enough of the field there. For me, that's an important distinction. Um, but 
the thing that I really like in what, I mean, I like a lot of what you're saying, but the thing that I really like in what you're saying is the last bit, because that is something that I think in focusing we rarely do, and I think would be a really interesting thing to incorporate. Often we bring attention to something, and we don't really pay much attention to the attention itself. There's something about the broader field that is really exciting. And I think, as you say, it tends to usually be in the background. That difference in what's foregrounded in attention, I think that's a fascinating thing to me. Yeah. Yeah, and then where it becomes a spiritual dimension is, you know, in Gentlin, I find, you know, he can say something that sounds like phenomenological descriptiveness, right? The body is the situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is contains a lot. It contains this, the noticing of undividedness. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a difference between intellectually contemplating undividedness and resting in it as a kind of ease. It's like struggle ends, there's no struggle. It all belongs to the field. And it, it's also there where, you know, the edges of the self sort of fray and you like, you, you'd still have this sense that, oh, you know, I, it's me who has to take care of things, you know, I have to eat and I have to pay my bills or it seems that way. Um, but some some deeper sense of belonging you know, to the world, mm -hmm. despite all its problems. Yeah. That's the spiritual dimension. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and it's like, it has something to do with, yeah, we could use that foregrounding the field. And then also, and in some kind of intention, not forceful, but a, a willingness, maybe openness to just resting in it. Mm -hmm. Now, then, so then this sounds like, I think on the surface, if we're just looking at it intellectually, it can sound like passivity, you know, it's like, oh, you're just accepting everything, you don't do anything, you're just sitting, you're just letting it happen. Um, <clears throat> it's a shift of emphasis, it's an antidote to struggle and feeling like something isn't quite right. And even if you reframe it the way, like what wants the prop, what does the problem want to do, there's still like lingering lingering feelings of it's not quite right something needs to you know change be better hopefully i'm not gonna focus on it we'll see invite it and there's all kinds of little ways one can get caught in this mm -hmm. um, but now if we shift and say we're resting in the field we're allowing it to be just the way it is struggle subsides there's ease. And then maybe if we think about it, our, our fear is, oh, then the inaction results from that. No, but it does invite now the kind of spontaneity that you are invoking too. It's like what wants to happen. Mm -hmm. The field is now very open 
for something to happen. Yeah. You know, so then do you let yourself be drawn into something and then just do that? And then I think all these all these mechanisms of a process phenomenology are completely in action. The question that arises for me as I follow, I think what I'm, I'm following what you're saying is um, what might be different in focusing, but I'm not sure, is two things that are linked. One is in that if you want to call it field of awareness, and I'm happy calling it that, um, resting in that to some extent in order to focus, maybe, or maybe, maybe not in order to focus, in order to just have that, Jenling, you know, talks a lot about clearing a space and having that cleared space. They can be very expansive. Mm -hmm. Within that cleared space, that open awareness, that field of awareness. Um, if I notice something that arises within that, I may notice an issue in my life that has a felt sense that comes quite quickly. Or another way of saying it is, I notice how I'm carrying something in my life, that that's a part of what arises in that open field. In focusing there, you would, as you know, you would have a relationship with that. It is very relational in that you bring some degree of sort of non-judgmental caring. It's a phenomenological attitude with mm -hmm. a degree of warmth or something. Mm -hmm. If So that's one thing is that the relational dimension where that might fit in the spiritual, more spiritual aspect you're talking about. The other thing is that when you bring that kind of relationship, as we were talking about before, then there's process that in that field, nothing just stays as it is. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention to it, it sort of almost takes on a life of its own or a consciousness of its own or something mm -hmm. and begins to move itself in particular ways. Mm -hmm. So the, the aspect of relationship and the aspect of process, I'm wondering how they fit in the more spiritual practice that you're describing, or do they fit? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's good. It could lead into a voicing my appreciation for focusing and how it's never left. Like, it, it held my interest, right? because... The danger in what I'm describing of like, well, you just rest in the field is that um, we skip over. And I think Jendlin has articulated that somewhere too. Of um, There can be a fantasy of being able to skipping over the personal. <laughs> like, you just go to this like transpersonal field like experience and then you can pretend to yourself that, you know, personal issues and personal development are, you know, second rate or would happen automatically. And I don't believe that. And that's why I keep introducing uh, the idea of felt sense to my students. It's like, um, there's something vital there. And there's a lot of information and we don't want to skip over that and sort of like say oh yeah there's just some body sensations there you know whatever you know like let's go back to the field um so did i say something i think it's yeah go ahead i want to just pick up the other side of that i appreciate that you're not wanting students to skip over things that actually need to process themselves or however you want to say that. I want to say the opposite in the focusing world, that <clears throat> the thing that I'm concerned about that can at times happen in the focusing world is that the focused attention is, is actually too narrow. Yeah, yeah. And it happens within 
not the huh? awareness you're talking about, but it happens within the person's pre-existing biases and understandings, and all of those things give the felt sense a very narrow space within which to change only in accordance with how it's allowed to change almost, if you could say it that way. That what we maybe need in the focusing world is a little more attention on appreciation of that slightly more meditative or at least more expansive space. Spending a bit more time making sure that that is there before developing relationship with whatever else is there. Yeah, I think there, yeah, I think you pointed out a, a complementarity and uh, I, I see all teachings as antidotal. So um, for Zen Buddhism, when it is starting to get stuck in this field, like in this expansive awareness, uh, focusing is a good antidote, you know, it's like, let's, let's not disregard these processes and say like, oh, they're just psychological or something. Or now you're, you're focusing on a self that really doesn't exist. Or something. Uh, and then the way you just said it is like in the focusing world, that can be exactly the opposite. You could use an antidotal teaching there, you know. Uh, which I think in your presentation was already present. And it's like, oh, like if you if you bring the mental posture of not trying to get to somewhere, right, but hold back from that intentionally and bring in an openness and basically ask what wants to be focused on, what wants, and once that happens, what 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 step wants to come. I mean. Jendon says it all the time, you have to let it come. You can't make it come. Yeah. Nonetheless, the human mind yeah. is tricky there. You know, it's like we know that. And it's it's a constant, you know, oh, I want too much, so I need to let it go. Right? So, Yeah, mm -hmm. that's where the presence of a listener can be very useful because a listener can notice where the focuser has adopted some kind of agenda rather than that more openness and simply reflect that back in a way that the focuser then has this invitation to rest back into this greater openness and not try to do anything. Now, let me say something there, too, that just, just I mean, this might be just a kind of weird bias that I have. As much as I appreciate, you know, how much teachers and fellow practitioners have helped me in my process, I, I still hold some sort of ideal that my practice is not divorced from my daily life. And there should be, any ideally should, you know, I don't know, but there's some kind of ideal that a certain organic and spontaneous process of staying in touch with the complexity of my life situation that is enfolded, implied, implicit in, or present as, like sometimes I talk about it, implexity, you know? Like the body has enfolded the complexity of the situation mm -hmm. and it carries it as an implexity. Now, if you can organically sort of be with that implexity, um, your action and speaking and unfolds, you know, and it would be nice, right, if that wasn't dependent on someone listening to you, processing. Yeah. So there's a need, I'm just recognizing a need in me to be able to hold the field myself. Yeah, I totally agree. So, so, but how is this like in a, in a learning process, you know, while you could sort of use someone else to hold the field for you for a while, what is the practice that empowers you and teaches you and gets you familiar with holding the field for yourself in a reliable way? In, in, in here is in Zen practice, something that I think is only sort of tangentially addressed in, 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 um, in focusing our minds get in the way. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discursive thinking going on that actually rattles along in these already charted, you know, pathways of like what we expect from life and, uh, and our mind tries to like rehashes this all the time. So Zen practice specifically is watch your thoughts come and go. They come and you learn over for most people over many years to not identify with your thoughts. And this is a this is a specific practice that when I started focusing as a self-taught person, it's like, oh, this clearing the space is not that's a pretty advanced practice already, you know, just to like find enough silence in your mind to notice the various things that are going on and recognizing what has most prevalence or importance. And you know, if you, if your mind is so busy that you're just like you know, have so much thought traffic. Mm -hmm. That already is hard, right? So I have benefited just from a dedicated practice of noticing thoughts, taking attention, bringing it back to the body, you know, until it stay, it can stay in the body effortlessly. I would, I'm, I'm partly I'm aware of time. I promised it was going to be an hour and it's, we've gone over time. Uh, but I want to respond to what you said, because it also feels important to me that um, I think what you're saying is that you're not satisfied if the practice, as you understand it, remains in sort of, I could say in a slightly dismissive way, sort of more rarefied places and doesn't show up in the person's actual living day to day. I would feel the same about focusing that if it's only restricted to focusing sessions, that's not really enough from my point mm -hmm. of view. To not bring focusing into your life and actually have it impact the way you relate to other people, the way you live, the way you understand your responses to nature or anything else that's happening for you, to use it also to you know, sort through difficulties like in your work situation or something, a problem occurs and you have a bodily felt response to it, if you know focusing to just right there and then be able to let your attention go down there. And even in relationship to your boss, for example, sometimes it's safe enough to actually process it. In terms of the thoughts that um, can be a real distraction and uh, hindrance, um, I don't think there's a very good answer to that. The one thing that I would say is, again, it, relationally, there are people often in a person's life that you know that's somebody I can talk to about something that really matters to me. Because you know in talking to them, you understand yourself better. There's something about their way of listening to you, maybe their way of not interrupting, of just kind of giving you some space that allows you, because you're in relationship to them, to get beyond all the interference that often comes when you're just with yourself. The relational aspect, I think, is an important part of the focusing practice. Um, but I also agree with you that being able to focus on your own is a really important not only resource that diminishes it too much it's an important way of being and learning how to focus alone is something that we don't emphasize as much in the focusing world i mean jendlin's first book was all about that mm -hmm. a lot of it was about that and that's where i first learned focusing and i first learned it on my own to do it with a listener or in a community was a, a second step for me and not always better although sometimes better mm -hmm. i i would again i think that your emphasis on the spiritual practice you're describing um is worth importing aspects of that in back into the focusing world makes sense to me mm -hmm. all right well, maybe it's not importing back maybe it's uh, carrying forward Ha, 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 ha.
Yeah. <laughs> I guess it is carrying forward, but um, it's also reviving something in the tradition that um, isn't emphasized much anymore. Well, there's something really rich in uh, Gentlin's intentional way of, as you said earlier, keeping it open, not tying it to something. Uh, also avoiding any kind of cliches between East and West and yeah. you know, recognizing that there's something here that is really uh, powerful and in a way new and belongs to our um, current cultural evolution too, you know. And I think for me, Zen Buddhism needs to evolve or you know i mm. i think i mean i'm studying texts from the 13th century and they have a lot of um interesting things that actually we just talked about in our own language but this uh, need for um being in touch with ourselves, if we want to circle back, like, like uh, uh, an authenticity in this in this wider sense, is not something that I'm finding, say, my lineage, you know, Dogen talking about. It. It's like it's not it's not of no concern to him. Seemingly, I mean, he's not bringing it up, but he talks about undivided activity. You know, he uh, says how we are you know not separate from anything that surrounds us the entire cosmos um so how to bring those two um concerns and needs together again a more existential dimension of you know this how you're existentially situated in the world and uh, and then also uh, a dimension of personal processing that is also undivided from that existential situatedness. You know, in actual fact, my view, it is expressed that way. <laughs> like we are express, we are expressing this this um, this wholeness through our personal activity. Right. So it's it's really it. In that sense, you know, whatever is whatever we have here now, we're just talking about because it's our practices, focusing and and Zen Buddhism. It's like how to, in a very open way, notice the what is at play phenomenologically without getting stuck in a particular language. And like I think we've done a good job, right? It's like we are in the same territory. We can use language in new ways and and try to sort this out for ourselves and for our time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really beautifully said. Thank you very much. I have really appreciated this. And I hope that there's some way that uh, we can maintain some connection and maybe between our communities as well. <laughs> yeah, I would like that. Let's explore it and... Uh... Yeah, I do respond to invitations. So. Okay. <laughs> and just, you know, you and I can stay in touch. I would, I would yeah. enjoy that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would enjoy that too. Thank you very much. I really, really yeah. enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, great conversation. I appreciate it too. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. See you. Bye for now. Bye.